You ever heard of the shrine of the Jesus of the tortilla? No? No? Well, in 1977, a woman named Maria Rubio was frying a tortilla when she noticed what appeared to be an image of Jesus burned into the tortilla. She took it to her husband and showed it to him, and he agreed wholeheartedly it was the image of Jesus. So she took it and showed it to the local priest, and the the priest blessed it. She took it home and she placed it in a a shadow box, or her husband did, in a shadow box, and they put it outside the the shed in their backyard. Within a few months, 8,000 people had come to visit the shrine of the Jesus of the Tortilla. Within two years, 35,000 people had made, I guess you could call it a pilgrimage, to come worship God at... I was going to say the feet of the tortilla, but I don't know what you would say. To go and to worship. Ironically, and this is quite ironic, in 2005, she allowed her granddaughter to take it to school for show and tell. And she dropped it. And the tortilla shattered into a thousand pieces. They tried to place the tortilla pieces back in the box, but no one else wanted to visit the tortilla anymore. And I guess you can understand why. It's silly, the links that people will go to worship uh, what they think or perceive to be an image of God or even sometimes God, a God, I should say. Obviously, we, we know it's silly because we don't base our worship off of what occurs in cookware. We base it off of truth. In fact, The second London Baptist Confession, which is 1689, uh, says this, the acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself and so limited by his own revealed will that he may not be worshiped according to the imagination and devices of men nor the suggestion of Satan under any visible representations or any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scriptures. That was written in 1689, and I think that still stands today, and I think we would agree with that. And yet we know from Scripture there's many instances where even those who claimed to worship God, even those who followed the Lord, got off track in their worship of the Lord. Just to give you some examples of, of where this happened, Cain offered an offering to the Lord, but not according to the, the, the requirements that God had given, rather according to his own preference. So we didn't make it very far in humanity before man had not only obviously been corrupted by sin, but began to corrupt the very worship of God. The first and the second commandments uh, teach us that we are not to have any other gods before us. We are not to make any graven images. The golden calf incident of Exodus uh, 32 show us that we cannot offer worship to God according to our values and our tastes. In Leviticus 10, uh, Nadab and Abihu offered what God called strange fire. They did not follow the standard that he had set forth. In, in 1 Samuel 15, 22, Saul worshipped God. Saul, in fact, took upon himself the office of the priest to worship God, to lead the nation in worship, out of his own impatience and his own arrogance. And God was not pleased. In fact, for that, God ripped the kingdom from him. In Matthew 15, Jesus rebuked the Pharisaical worship that was according to the, and I quote, the tradition of the elders. Paul characterized the worship of some of the Colossians as will worship or self-made religion in Colossians 2.18. And of course, we know the Corinthian church had issues not just in morality, but also in the abuse of spiritual gifts. The purpose in reading that is that many of those, those people were either representatives of God or were 
followers themselves of God. There's a lot of debate around Saul if Saul was a genuine believer in the Messiah, a follower of God or not. Because you look at the fruit of his life and sometimes, I mean, he was empowered by the Holy Spirit to prophesy. That's a pretty strong, uh, a pretty strong uh, act of genuine worship of God when the Holy Spirit overcame him and he prophesied on behalf of God. Yet we also know, as I said there, he... He worshiped God in his own manner and it displeased the Lord so much that he removed the kingdom from him. When we, talked about the pra- when, when we talk about the practices of holy worship, it can, be a, uh, it can be a difficult subject because God has outlined, I think, pretty clearly parameters for us to worship him. But we often desire more. In fact, I'm not kidding. I was reading a book this afternoon uh, this book, it's called Mountain Rain. It, it's about uh, it, it, a missionary of James Fraser, kind of an obscure missionary. I'd never heard of him, and I've, I've known a lot of missionaries over the years. And I found this book very, very challenging. But he, he wrote this. I just I happened to read this two hours ago. And he's talking about, he goes to these, he's in these mountain region uh, of um, south, southwest China, which is kind of the north part of Southeast Asia. And he's there working among the, uh, the Lisu people. And, and uh, he's seeing God work. Thousands of people have gotten saved. Thousands upon thousands have gotten saved. And he travels from village to village teaching and preaching. And um, he had this to say after a couple years of teaching these infant churches, he found, too, that they were all too concerned about secondary and external issues. Could they eat beans pickled in alcohol? Could they wash their clothes on Sundays? These things preoccupied them. James wanted to teach them more important truths about God. And I found it just very ironic, the same issue that these mountain people uh, this Lisu people group have is the same problem that we often struggle with on a personal level, but also on a church level. It's simply easier. We want someone to tell us, what do I do? What does God want me to do? Can I eat pickles or, or beans that have been pickled in alcohol? That's a good question. I'm not going to answer that for you because I think the Holy Spirit should answer that for you. You know, is it okay to wash clothes on Sunday? Well, you don't answer to me for that. You answer to the Lord. And that's what James in, in this story or in the biography was, was frustrated with. He wanted to teach them how to know God better. And in knowing God better, they would then know what is acceptable. And he said it elsewhere, the Holy Spirit was a far better teacher than he was. And I think that's obviously the desire that we should all have. But frankly, that takes hard work sometimes. We just want someone to tell us, what are the checks? What what can we do? What are the yeses? What are the noes? Give us clarity. What should we do? And of course, I I realize as a a pastor, I'm here to shepherd people, and I'm here to help answer those questions and help spur people on. But may we all desire to make sure that we worship the Lord in holiness and that we know that out of our own walk, not just because pastor or a church or another church member has told us and so i want to get into the worship the actual worship uh, that we are supposed to have as a church and we're going to start with the purpose of worship the purpose of worship very plainly is to give god glory we know that is the purpose it's the chief end of man it is the sole reason that we gather together a body of believers who are very different and diverse yet can gather together to give one god the only true god genuine worship But right away, I want you to see that that worship focuses on the right thing, the right person. So go to 2 Samuel chapter 6, because this is a very appropriate passage as David is preparing to bring the ark back to to Jerusalem. The ark was uh, lost under Eli, and uh, he is bringing it back, actually, if you recall the story, I think it's kind of a humorous story. It is a wonderfully humorous story, if you recall it. 
uh, the, uh, the Philistines have captured the ark and they put it in the temple with all their other gods. And what happened at night? All their gods fell over and worshipped the ark and they set them back up and they thought, oh, you know, maybe they wondered if something else had happened and they put them back up and they fell over again and I believe the hands and the heads fell off of all their statues and so they put the, uh, the ark on an ox cart and sent it back to Israel. Get this, this, like a token of bad luck is what they thought. Get it out of our country, send it back to Israel. And so the ark comes back and it sat uh, not in Jerusalem but in someone's home for, for quite a long time. And David goes to retrieve it to bring it back to jerusalem but david didn't do it the way that god prescribed remember he he goes to bring it back on a cart and i can't remember the gentleman's name who puts his hand on it emily help me out he died he did die does anyone know the guy's name off the top of their head Uzzah, yeah, Uzzah puts his hand out to steady it, and in doing that, he touches what God commanded not to touch, and he dies, and David realized he's made a mistake. He has tried to accomplish worship of God in his own way, not ascribed, not the way that has been prescribed by God. Well, David goes, and he gets his heart right, and he studies, and he prepares, and he comes back, and he worships God the right way. And that's what I want to I pick up here in verse 13. And it was so that when they, were, when they bare the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in the place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had had pitched for it and David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord and as soon as David had made an end of offering burnt offerings and peace offerings he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and he dwelt among all the people even among the whole multitude of Israel as well as to the women and the men and to everyone a cake of bread and he goes on David begins to or continues to worship the Lord not as necessarily a king this is a debated, it doesn't need to be a debated subject, but he took off his kingly apparel. For he was just a man before the Lord that day. And David focuses on the right person here, and God is pleased. He's pleased because David humbles himself before the Lord. He wore, as it said here in Ephod, humble garments, not royal robes. He danced before the Lord, in other words, joyfully praising God. Literally, the word means twirling. And he's devoted to God. His devotion to God is even despised by Michael here in verse 16, by his wife. She keeps it quiet. But David dedicates this effort to the Lord, and he does it the way or the manner in which God prescribed it. So his devotion is on the right person, and he's doing it to accomplish the right purpose. David's no longer trying to get something from God, but he's trying to give God the glory. It's not about David as king bringing the ark back. It's about God. And worship is not about you, just as it wasn't about David. When we come here to worship, it is about God and God alone. It's about giving God glory. And so the church gathers a gathering of other believers with one singular focus, and our focus is to give God glory. Now I want to move on to the principles of worship because the principles then are also from this passage and, and another one we're going to look at. David worshiped the Lord. It doesn't say here that he worshiped the Lord in spirit and in truth, but that's essentially what he's doing. He's in agreement now, with the Holy Spirit, with the prescribed methodology that God had laid out, and he does it for the genuine worship of God, not for his own personal praise. He's not bringing the, tab uh, the, the ark back any longer to be pleased himself, or, or to make God happy, or so that God would be happy with him. He's doing it so that God gets the glory. And there's a very subtle difference there. Did, did you catch that? 
David is not bringing the ark back to get something from God or for God to be happy with him. He's bringing it back so that God gets the glory. And the same thing must be true of us. When we gather together, we must be gathered together to unite together to give God glory, not to get something from God and not to check off a box that God will be pleased because I did what he asked. And so here, David accomplishes that purpose by worshiping God in the Spirit. And I think it was costly for him in two ways. One way, as you see in verse 13, is every six paces he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. Or or offerings were given so that God would be glorified and pleased with what was being done. But the second is it cost him humility. For his wife is not very pleased with him. And yet in verse 7, he pitched, or he, he, he set, set it in the, in the place and in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it, and David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. So he offers offering, but he also resides with the people. This isn't about him being the king sitting upon a throne. This is about him humbling himself before the Lord. And when we humble ourselves before the Lord and we offer that type of offering, God is pleased. That's when the heart is involved. He also worships God in truth because his his worship now is focused on the truths of God, not what he desires to get, not his own patterns, not his own comforts, not his own traditions. And by the way, I even wonder if David didn't quite understand. I don't, I can't prove this. I don't know. But David, the, the, uh, the ark arrives at Obed's home Uh, Obed-Edom's home on a cart sent by the Philistines and it sat there I don't remember how long but for quite a while and his his uh his home is blessed because of that and David hears and he goes to get the the ark and he just puts it on a cart I don't know what went into his thought process maybe he thought that's how it arrived that how it can that's how it can continue But I think it's fair to say he didn't take the prescribed method of Leviticus serious enough where the poles were to be inserted in the side rings of the ark and it was to be carried by the priests. He didn't do that. Either he didn't know about it or he didn't think it valuable information that he needed to follow. But he got it right the second time. And so he, he worshipped, the this, this second time, he worshipped God in truth. It wasn't based on his feelings. It wasn't based on his pride. It wasn't based on his goals. It was based on how God had prescribed the worship and the carrying of the ark to take place. A better example, I've, you might know that I'm going there, is the Gospel of John. I've quoted it loosely. that We are to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. So if you go with me to John chapter 4, I think I preached on this about three years ago, so it might be familiar. The story will be familiar, for it's the woman at the well. But if you are familiar with the story, you know it's a, a bit of an odd exchange between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. I remember for years I was puzzled by this because the conversation seems to be all over the place. First, he's asking for water, and she doesn't understand that the water he's saying is not of the well that he can give her, but but living water, and she doesn't really understand that. And then she very quickly moves on to worshiping at Mount Gerizim versus worshiping in Jerusalem. And I was often puzzled by that, and I think there's a purpose for it. Um, In fact, a couple years ago, I think I would have told you that that purpose is true. That purpose is she's trying to get... She's drawing a line, a division between the Samaritan form of worship and the Jewish uh, or Judean form of worship. The Jewish form is you worship in Jerusalem as God has prescribed. We got all the Old Testament for you to follow. You follow those principles and you worship God correctly. The Samaritans, on the other hand, hated the Jews, didn't want to go to Jerusalem, so they, they worshipped at Mount Gerizim. And they worshipped the Lord according to the principles and methods that they felt comfortable with. 
And so she's trying to create a debate with Jesus, which is the proper place. Do we go to Jerusalem or do we worship in Samaria? Who's right? And she even makes a statement that when the Messiah comes, he'll straighten everything out. And he's kind of like, I'm here. <laughs> Let me straighten this out for you. And that's where this conversation moves. She says in verse 19, the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worship, worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman goes on, she saith unto him, I know that Messiah comes. <laughs> and he has to get really simple with her. Now here's what's so important for us today as we're talking about the principles of worship. It gives us the two primary principles. If I could boil it down, Jesus boiled it down to that, that far, so I think I can too. We are to worship him in spirit and in truth. We see a, a decent example of that in David, but I think we have better principles laid out here under Jesus' teaching. And, and notice what Jesus highlights the worship of the Samaritans was only spiritual, spirit worship. Or in other words, we would say the heart, emotions. That's what their worship is. Notice what Jesus says. I lost track of where I'm at. Let me find it. <laughs> uh, Jesus saith unto her, verse 21, so she poses the question, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, notice these words, ye worship, ye know not what. What's he saying? He's saying you lack knowledge. Oh, they might have a veracity in their worship, a spirit, an emotional will, a desire, but they lack knowledge. They deny all but the Pentateuch. They deny all but the first five books of the Bible. So they ignore the rest. He says you have partial truth, but you don't worship the Lord in full truth. You don't even know what you're worshiping. And I dare say it's pretty clear that that's true because she doesn't know what. She doesn't know that she's talking to the Messiah. So pretty good evidence. She's lacking knowledge in her worship. The Samaritans as a whole, they're lacking knowledge. They neglect the full truth of God. And so he, Jesus here rebukes the Samaritans for only worshiping in spirit. And boy, what an apt description of churches today. I mean, I think the same is true. The same could be true of, of not all, but many churches today. You know not what you worship. The average church member I don't think has a very good handle on what they worship, who they worship even. Now, I have a lot of discussions with, with people about various churches in our area at times, and I think there's some really good churches in our area that preach the gospel. We all know this to be true. There's other churches that preach the gospel. They preach good, sound doctrine. There's other churches that preach good, sound doctrine, but, you know, their, their music, mm, right? We know that. We know there's churches like that. I think there's a whole other level of churches that um, preach the truth. In other words, like sometimes the pastor might accidentally stumble across the gospel in his message. But if you ask the average church member, they don't really have much of a clue. And that's sad. That there's so many people who can attend a church and not know who they worship or what they worship. So that's the problem of the Samaritans. It's a big problem, obviously, because it means they're not worshiping the one true God. If they don't know him, then they're not worshiping him correctly. And that's what Jesus is driving at. Now, the flip side of that is the Jews. The Jews, 
only worship in truth. So he says to her, ye know not what you worship. We know, he's lumping himself in with the Jews, we know what we worship. But I've got a nice little colon there in my Bible. Now, it's not, that colon's not inspired, but it does mean that there's probably a grammatical break. And in, in the Greek grammar, there is a grammatical break there. You know what Jesus is basically saying? The Jews only worship in truth. They have the truth. They know the law. They know the law like the back of their hand. They know the law so well, they've added extra laws, right? They know they have knowledge of God. But what does he imply then that they're lacking? Spirit. Oh, they've got knowledge of God. You do this, and you do this, and you do this, but don't do that, don't do that, and don't do that. And if, Just do these things, and, and you're going to know God. But they worship God only in truth, not in spirit. That's Jesus' point. In fact, he makes that pretty clear. He even says here uh, in verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. It's not about the place of worship, right? God is going to live among men. That's what Jesus is bringing about. And that's what he's addressing here. But it's beyond just the place of worship. It's the form of worship. And it must be done in spirit and in truth. Both. Not one not the other. So shame on us if we ever worship the Lord only in spirit, not in truth. And shame on us if we only worship the Lord in truth and not in spirit. And that's what Jesus is driving at here. The, the Jews failed to apply the truth to their heart. It just became a form, a tradition, a set of rules to follow to check off the box and appease one's own conscience. They lacked love, they lacked grace, they lacked mercy, they lacked the forgiveness of God. And so he highlights that both the Samaritans and the Jews are wrong. God is a spirit and we must worship him in the balance of spirit and truth. And so he highlights that balance of worshiping in, in knowledge, truth, and in spirit as well, which would be an, an internal agreement of the heart. And that's what we're to do. We're to accomplish worship properly by worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And those two principles, if you want to call them that, I actually struggled calling them principles, but if, if you want to boil it down to those two principles, they have to both be present if we're worshiping the Lord. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. I just tried to think through some different terminology that God has used to... Uh, to uh, uh, to help convey the, the aspect of worshiping in spirit and in truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, we are to have a yielded spirit, a heart that is open to the prompting of God, a heart that's ready to receive the truth of God, ready to be renewed. We're to have thoughts that are centered around the truth. Psalm 19, verse 14 tells us that. actually uses the word heart there, but it's really meant... To, to convey the mind's determination, a mind ready to focus on the truth regardless of the cost. A heart of meditation that is centered on the truth of God. I don't know about you, and we'll get, we can get into some uh, helps in worship another time, but, but I have a hard time calming my mind. I think, I get on rabbit trails quickly and I take them very far <laughs> to bizarre places sometimes. And I know when I pray, I have to close my eyes. Otherwise, my mind will be distracted. I just, I know I have to. I, in fact, don't even understand how people cannot close their eyes. Maybe that's a little glimpse into what's going on in here. Don't look further. I have to work diligently to guard my mind in time of worship. Maybe it comes easier for some people. But I have to help myself make it as easy as possible so that my thoughts are centered on the truth of God. We're to come to God with a reverential heart. The term, the fear of the Lord, is used multiple times. In, in 2 Chronicles 19, verse 9, Jehoshaphat 
King Jehoshaphat restores genuine worship. And the highlight in that passage is the fear or the reverence of the Lord. So when we, when we gather together here as one body or whether we are, we are alone or whether we are with two or three other people studying, we must make sure that there's reverence in our worship. It doesn't matter if we're, we're sitting together in a growth group or, or whether the wild kids are gathered together or the youth group gathered together, we must make sure that there is reverence and fear of the Lord. Another phrase that popped out to me was a united, united mind. Psalm 86, 11, people were united around the truths of God. Philippians is very clear on this as well as Ephesians. The unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And we're to worship one God, and one truth, and one mind, and one spirit. We're to have a determined heart. Psalm 57, 7 tells us that. A heart that is determined to give God the praise that he deserves. Psalm 139, verse 23, we're to have a penitent heart or a repentant heart. Heart that's ready to confess, drawing close to the Lord because we know we need him. All those things help us with that balance of spirit and truth. And it's easy. It's easy to be swayed one way or the other. It's easy to appeal to intellectual people with just truth. And it's easy to appeal to just emotional people with just the Spirit. And that's where many churches go astray. We have to make sure that what we do is in spirit and in truth. Well, let's get to the parts of worship because, again, there's, I think, many parts throughout Scripture that are given to us. If the goal is always to give God glory, and we do that by worshiping in spirit and in truth, how do we accomplish that? Well, (laughs) I've got all, I don't even know how many it is, but all the way to L. That's a lot. And there's more. I just got tired of looking up verses, I guess you could say. So L is really just a compilation of a bunch more. We, we, We worship the Lord by reading our Bible. If we don't know what the Bible says, how are we gonna worship God? Right, that's the problem of the Samaritans. They worshiped in spirit, but they lacked truth. So we must pursue truth, and the only place for us to find truth is God's word. Coupled with that would be the preaching of the Bible, singing the Bible. We're to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in our heart unto the Lord. We need to make sure that the music that we sing is based on truth and spirit. Right? We could, I'm sure we could come up with some doctrinally boring songs to sing that totally lack any kind of passion. And we could easily find a bunch of passion songs that lack truth. Those are quite prevalent. We need to make sure that we can sing with a loud voice, giving God glory for what he's done, but sing the truth. Prayer is an absolute aspect of, of worship. And I'm excited when we finish this series to begin a series on prayer. I've already changed my topics. Five, all five topics have been changed in this five-part series. It'll probably change again before we get there. I'm enjoying so much studying that, but that's, actually, that's a, an absolute necessity to worship God. We must communicate with Him And we must be open to communication from him. By the way, I kind of have some doubles in here that are coupled around prayer. We're to give tithes and offerings. It's our sacrifices that we can give to the Lord. Our, 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 Our praise that we can offer to him. To give him glory. To, to give him thanks for what he's done. We can worship the Lord in service. And there's Uh, I don't know, half a dozen people right now doing just that. They're not here with us, but they're enabling us to to be united in our focus of God while they minister to little ones. Absolutely a form of worship. We don't think that usually, right? It's like, oh, it's my turn in the nursery. I'm stuck. 
or, oh, it's my turn to clean the bathrooms, or it's my turn to do this task or that task. When's the last time you thought of your service as an act of worship to God? We're to do it in a joyful manner. The Bible's clear about that. We're not drug in here to, to pour out thanks to God, you know, again. We're to give joyful praise. We're to give thanksgiving. Thanks for what He has done, for who He is. And that, that's close to prayer, but it's not just prayer. It's done in song. It's done in service. It's done in how we speak out in the foyer when we, we speak with other believers. Are we giving God thanks for what He's doing in our life? It's done in how we offer or give offerings. Are we giving God thanks for what He's done? So it's not necessarily a standalone. It's always coupled as most of these are. Praise. Psalm 100 verse 4. We are to praise the Lord continually. We're to offer thanks. And by the way, often that takes contemplation on our part to realize what God is truly or is genuinely doing in our life. I was just talking with someone a few minutes ago talking about um, how much they've learned over the course of a difficulty. Giving great praise to God. And is that probably not true of all of us? Some of the greatest times of spiritual advancement in our life have been during difficulty. But usually we don't realize it during the difficulty. It's after the fact. We give God thanks for what he's done. We realize the growth and we realize the tender mercies of God in dealing with us. Confession, John 1 verse 9, is absolutely a part. I think that's supposed to be 1 John 1 9. We're to confess to the Lord, give him praise so that we come to him with a repentant heart, a heart that is prepared to receive the truth. All of these working together in spirit and in truth. There's other elements, as I said, fasting, vows, oaths, they're all important. And all these issues, there's principles like 1 Corinthians 14, 40, let all things be done decently and in order. There's other guiding principles, but always to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. These principles free the church. They free the church from, from any form of irreverence and, and idiocy that turns a church service into a, into a circus act. I, I gag almost even to think about one time observing a church service where there was um, interpretive dance. It was very inappropriate. It was very odd. Uh, it was not at all glorifying to God. It was distracting. But I'm sure it was comfortable for some people. And I, I cringed as I, as I, I watched it uh, in, in some, uh, some manner of attempt to please God, yet violating much of what he's prescribed. As long as we follow these principles of worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth, and we incorporate the methods that God has laid out, like singing and tithing and all those things, God can be pleased. God will be pleased. But I want you to notice, God kind of leaves out some of the specifics. In fact, maybe you're even saying, Pastor, you, um, you kind of glossed over the fact that David danced. I don't have a problem with it. I shouldn't have, you shouldn't have a problem with it. God didn't have a problem with it. Now, it, it's very different from dancing today, right? <laughs> that's, that's the issue. Like many forms of worship, they can be distorted. But David danced. He put on a linen ephod and he, he twirled before the Lord in, in joyful exuberance for the ark coming back. He he 
couldn't contain himself and hopped along, whatever you want to call it. He wasn't dancing inappropriately. He wasn't gyrating in some uh, sexual form. He was giving God praise. It was a very humble thing to do. In fact, that's what offended Michael. As she looked out and she saw the king behaving like a common person, she was offended. Uh, You know what else David used? Since I'm just going to hit one hot topic or another. David used drums. He used drums and cymbals and all forms of percussion. By the way, he was an incredible strings player. So he had the first guitar, apparently, or harp of some kind. And he used all those things to praise God. Now, I think differently than society uses them. So obviously, there's, there's a balance there, but David used them in a way that was filled with truth and spirit. In Africa, we, this was something we battled. We, we, we were okay with drums. They had, you know, like what you'd see in a movie or something, little goats, literal goat skin, like it was on the goat a couple weeks before. <laughs> goat, goat skin drum, and they'd put it between their legs and they'd, and they'd bang out a rhythm. I was okay with playing with that because, well, it's not like it's a big old trap set banging away. And the local pastor said, no, we cannot do this. It is absolutely associated in our culture with demon worship. Well, I didn't know that. I would have no problem if somebody next week appropriately brought in a goatskin drum. We, we used it gently. It didn't distract. It didn't pull away from worship the Lord in spirit or in truth. There's no problem with that. Nobody's going to do it, but that's okay. Brenda Klingerman always wanted to bring her tambourine, right? She did. I told her one time, I said, just bring it. It'll be okay, bring it. Oh, pastor, I could never do that. (laughs) We all know Brenda wasn't going to go off on a big tambourine solo. (laughs) It would have been okay. As long as we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. If it's not distracting from the truth of the Lord, then it's okay. As long as it's coupled with the spirit of heartfelt worship. And so I just, I just lay that out there. I'm not trying to cause problems. But just like I read of the Lisu people, they wanted the missionary to tell them, what are the do's and the don'ts? Give us the parameters of how we can worship. And that he was, he was emphatic that the Holy Spirit can provide those parameters far better than he could. But we must make sure that we worship God in spirit and in truth according to the principles that he's given. And the reason why is because of the pleasure of worship. If you would go to Psalm 145. Because this should be the result of worshiping God. God gets the glory. We know that. That's the objective. That's the purpose. And in the process, we should be led to the greatness of God. That's what worship does. It calls us to unite together in a way that gives God glory. And God alone, not us, not our personal desires, not our flesh, God and God alone gets the glory. And that's what worship should do for you and what it should do for me. It should lead me to the greatness of God. When we worship God, we, we're led to understand Him better, resulting in devotion. When we worship God, we are led to be pure. We live better because we know our Savior better. Not necessarily that we feel better, right? That's what A lot of people go to church so they feel better. Sometimes the truth doesn't always make us feel better. But it does result in us being pure. When we worship God, we're filled with joy. We talked about this in our growth group on, on Wednesday. Happiness results from circumstances, but joy results from knowing and drawing close to the Lord. And there's a big difference. The pleasure of God's presence is found in worship 
both, both corporate and personal. And I know I've said this many times, our corporate worship should be an overflow of our private worship. Notice what Psalm 145 says. We're going to read a lot. I just urge you to consider what's being said and worship the Lord as we say it. I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty, and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness." They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. That is worship of God. Focused entirely on God, drawing them closer, knowing God better. And in closing, notice the results of verse 12. To make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Worship should lead us to the greatness of God so that we can lead others to the greatness of God. That should be the result in our life, to speak highly of our great God. Notice how many times that psalm brought that out over and over again, the greatness of of God. May we lead others to worship the one that we long to give praise. That we would lift God up the way David here lifts the Lord up. That we would focus on the, the attributes and the nature of God as David has focused on it because he knows God better. That's what worship should do. With our whole heart invested in finding the truth of God. And doing that, it spills over into other people's lives as well. That we would be led to the greatness of God and we would lead others. That is our call. So may God get the glory for it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, well, we thank you that we can gather together with a whole group of believers to give you praise. Lord, I thank you that we worship you in truth for you have given us your word and we can know you and we can discover this knowledge and we can we can implant it in our minds and recall how good you are and how marvelous are your works but lord we thank you that you also give us your spirit so that we can apply your knowledge to our life to gain wisdom So as we move forward, we can continue to worship you with a heart of devotion, a passion to make your name known, to sing your praises, to declare your goodness. Lord, make it easy for us to give you our tithes, to give you our thanks, to give you our praise, to give you our confession. Lord, I pray we would Tomorrow, wake up with a hunger to know you more and that we would devote time to your word, the discovery of truth with the application of a passionate heart. Lord, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to be free from the distractions that so easily pull us away. And the Lord, when we gather together again as a body, that the praise and the thanks and the confession 
and the glory to your name would exude from our lives. Lord, may we long to be around other church members who are filled with that joy, not just happiness, but joy. And may it be to the praise of your name. We thank you for all that you do. and We ask that you bless our time of worship as we continue. In Christ's name we pray, amen.